Yes, so I was going to start with my introduction. Uh, Matt did a very good job at summarizing it, but I still, I'm still going to cover it uh, because I wrote a couple of, couple of paragraphs on it already, so <laughs> I will still do it. Um, yes, so many people have probably seen me around here and there, or my husband, and many times, a lot of the times actually, people ask me, do you work for the clinic? And I was like, no, I would say no. Do you work for GMM? And I would answer, no, GMM, one micronation mission. And up to last year, if people asked me, do you work for, for GAA, I would say, no. And then they would be like, so what do you do? And I would say, I'm a student. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm most of the time here and there. My name is Sarai, and I was born and raised in the country of Mexico. And when I was 17, I moved to Oregon to learn English. In 2007, I started college at La Sierra University in Riverside, one of the Adventist colleges in California. And while I was there, and when I was about to finish my last year of school, I was looking for a job. And my friend who worked in the education department at La Sierra said, hey, there's a sign, literally a piece of paper, a blank piece of paper. Well, it wasn't blank anymore because there was something printed on it. And it said, teach in Saipan. And then it had some palm trees and then an email address at the bottom. So I had sent an email, and in 2011, I moved to Saipan to teach middle school math and science at the Saipan SDA school. So this is me in September 2011. Uh, you can see John there as well. And that's where we met for the first time. It was not love at first sight, but you can hear about our story later if you want to. Um, I moved, originally moved to Saipan for a year. That one year became three years. I met John, like I said. We got married in 2016 and moved to, here to Guam in 2019. Um, John came to Guam when he was one year old, so even though I had never lived on Guam, it was like coming home, right, for, for both of us. And so a couple of months later, I enrolled at the University of Guam Master's of Biology program. And my passion lies in teaching math and science and helping students find their passion in those subjects as well. So I have always done a science background and not an education background, um, but I really, really enjoy teaching. I uh, also wanted to show you my, the most recent picture of everybody in my family. I have a, what you can say, a small family for a Mexican family. Uh, I have two brothers that are younger than me. Their names are Abimael and Moises. Abby is the one wearing the hat, and Moises is the one with the um, um, square, or yeah, the one on the right, all the way on the right side. Um, my mom and my dad, um, the older people in the picture, uh, recently retired, or retired a couple of years ago after being in pastoral ministry for 34 years. And Denise is my sister-in-law, uh, right in the middle. And my brother and her just got married in January of this year, and they're expecting their first baby. Um, hopefully by May, the baby will be born. And well, you know John, but that's my whole family, and this was in December of last year. Personally, being in Guam has been a great blessing in my professional and spiritual life. Since we moved here almost five years ago, my faith has grown stronger, my prayers are a little bit bolder, I have made more risk, risky moves that led me to see God's guidance more clearly. However, I do not want you to think in any way that has, that has come as easy as I say it. I believe the main reason I have grown so much is because since moving to Guam, I have struggled the most. My faith has been tested the most. I have probably not prayed as much as before, even though my prayers are a little bit more bold. I don't pray as much as I used to. I have gone through very tough emotional and spiritual situations. And through it all, I have seen God's guidance through my friends, family, and those people around me. You could say I'm on the other side now because I no longer experience constant worry and feelings of anxiety, confusion, or anger. And although I will not be sharing my testimony today, I wanted to come and share this moment with you as a personal testament 
of God's unending love and a challenge to myself. And Pastor Tenorio, I reached out to him a couple of um, months ago, and I said, hey, if you ever need somebody to help you preach, I would like to do that. So he communicated to me that you have been spending the past couple of months exploring what we call in the church the 28 fundamental beliefs. So today we will be exploring growing in Christ. And because it's impossible to cover the whole topic in this short amount of time, I would like to invite you that maybe when you go home today, you uh, can look a little bit more into the topic. And if you're interested, I have a digital copy where the fundamental belief is written, and I, bro I broke it down in little bullet points, and then all the verses really supporting that belief is at the bottom. I've also created or wrote a little table with all the verses in the ESV version, King, New King James and King James Version. I prefer I read in New King James, but I know many people enjoy King James Version. That's why I did those three. So if you would like to an e-copy, just let me know after the service, and then uh, I'll, I'll give it to you. Uh, let's pray before we begin. Uh, the Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for this moment with this church. Uh, please help us together ex to explore uh, the fundam this fundamental belief of growing in Christ and help us to challenge ourselves at the end of this um, moment to, to, to grow in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Bible talks about a man who after seeing the love Christ showed toward children and how tenderly he received them, the heart of this man was deeply moved that he felt a desire to be his disciple. Do you, go, do you guys know who this man was? His desire to follow Jesus was so profound that as Jesus was going on his way, you know, he got up from blessing the he children, he ran after him. And kneeling at his feet, he asked with sincerity and earnest in his heart a question that he probably had been in his mind over and over again for a while now. Even after attending the synagogue and learning the Torah and the Jewish oral traditions. Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Do you guys know who this man is now? This man is traditionally known as the rich young ruler, which means that he had great possessions and occupied a position of responsibility. And there are two contrasting views of himself in his heart. He didn't think himself as somebody that was defective in any way, yet he was not satisfied either. In observing Jesus' interactions with the children, he felt the great need of something he lacked. Couldn't Jesus just bless him as well, the same way he blessed the children and satisfied the want of his soul? And this reminds me of Ecclesiastes 3.11. So I usually don't put the, the verses on the screen, so you guys can look them up. So Ecclesiastes 3.18 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. And this part of he has put eternity in their hearts always gets me. And I looked up in a SDA commentary, and it says the following. When it says he has put um, eternity in their hearts, that means in their, in their thoughts. It is God's design that man realized that the present material world does not constitute the sum of his existence. He is linked to two worlds, physically to this world, but mentally, emotionally, and psychologically to the eternal world. Even with his consciousness beclouded by sin, man seems dimly aware that he ought to continue living beyond the narrow confines of this unsatisfying life. And I believe that this dissatisfaction is what was moving in the um, rich young ruler's life. And I have felt this dissatisfaction myself. A great need of something more, especially in days that are really, really stressful, and I don't want to do anything else, and I cannot take anything else on my plate. I would like something beyond my current condition. 
because for the, for the ruler, in spite of his great riches and important position in society, he still felt the great need that he lacked something. So Jesus asked him, why do you call me good? He asked to test the ruler's sincerity. Did the ruler realize that the one to whom he was speaking was the son of God? What was the true sentiment of the rich young ruler's heart? And Jesus, of course, didn't wait for an answer. He went on to say that keeping the commandments was necessary, and then he went on quoting several commandments that speak of man's duty to his fellow men. And we know what the, the ruler responded. All these things I have kept from my youth. And as Jesus looked at the face of the young man, he loved him. I don't know if anybody has just seen you for the first time and you see how much they love you from that one interaction. I've never experienced that. But I always wonder what people went through when Jesus looked at them and they saw that Jesus loved them. The Redeemer longed to see the ruler in a humble and contrite heart, conscious of the supreme love to be given to God and hiding its lack in the perfection of Christ. And we can read um, in Luke 8, 18, 22, and 23 what happens after that. So Luke 18, 22, and 23 says, So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Verse 23, but when, he's, when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. This man, is, it kind of reminds me of Judas. You know, Judas, the disciples were like, wow, Judas is like the super disciple. Everybody really liked him. Everybody enjoyed being around him, and everybody thought he was the number one out of all the 12. The, the own disciples thought he was their number one, their, their best representative out of all of them. And this man also, this rich young ruler, possessed many qualifications that if he were to be united with the Savior, that would enable him to become a power for good, a representative for Christ. However, and sadly, he rejected the call. And how about you? What one thing do you like? I personally think that I absolutely like more than one thing. But if we are honest with ourselves, there is really one thing, the one thing we keep coming back to. And I can sit here and contemplate my life and I always find it. I do not know if all the things that we lack can be listed from like really bad to not so bad. However, what is true is that what we keep back, whatever is really bad or just a little bit bad, if we keep it from God, is to retain that which would lessen moral strength and efficiency. Because it doesn't matter how small or how big it is, ultimately it becomes very absorbing of your time. And this happens to me very often. I catch my, when I drive, I don't know if this happens to you, but when I drive, I often think about a lot of things, especially when I don't put a podcast or music or anything, it's just quiet. It's a lot of, I spend a lot of thinking, a lot of time thinking when I drive. And sometimes I catch myself enjoying my life a little bit too much and not even longing for heaven anymore. And like the, the young ruler, do we want heavenly treasures, but also the temporal advantages riches can bring? Do we desire eternal life, but we're not willing to make any sacrifices? For the ruler, the cost of eternal life seemed too great, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And I think Jesus went away sorrowful as well. It wasn't just the, it wasn't just the rich young ruler. So Jesus left Galilee. The Bible says in previous chapters that Jesus was going through Samaria and Galilee. And he left Galilee and entered Jericho. 
a beautiful city. Even in, 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 the new, in the Old Testament, it was a very beautiful city with palm trees and rich gardens, watered by living springs. And in this city lived many priests because in ancient times, it was set apart, apart for priests to live in, live in. Overall, it was a very transited city. There was a lot of traffic of Roman soldiers and Roman officials and also many publicans. And one of these publicans was, can you guys guess? Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector. And we can find it the same story in that chapter 18. Uh, the story of the rich young ruler, I believe it's in many, in at least three books of the Bible, but the story of Zacchaeus is only in that, in that chapter. So that's why I chose that over all the other chapters for, for the rich young ruler. And just as many other people far and wide had heard of Jesus, Zacchaeus had heard of Jesus as well. Zacchaeus had heard of Jesus' kindness and courtesy towards the groups that were usually disliked. We know that um, the, the, um, the tax collectors, all, everybody that fell under the sinners um, group for the Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, Jesus really was very, very kind and loving towards them. And only three miles away from Jericho, uh, John, Zacchaeus had come across John the Baptist. And I brought this map because in, in the stories of John the Baptist, it's not specified exactly where in the Jordan River he was at, but in proximity to Jericho, we can make a, a guess that it, John the Baptist would have preached around there. And John the Baptist was also very well known and a little bit controversial for his time, so I'm sure Zacchaeus had heard of him and, um, and his preaching. There is a part on the Bible in Luke 3, 12 and 13, and I'm going to read it out loud. Um, and commentaries believe that Zacchaeus was part of the group that asked this question. So I'm going to read it. Then the tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, to John the Baptist, what shall we do? And then John the Baptist, and he said to them, John the Baptist, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. So in hearing this, Zacchaeus, in, in Zacchaeus hearing this, there was a longing in him for a better life. The words of John the Baptist impressed his heart, and he knew that what he was doing was wrong. And so that interaction with John the Baptist, you know, and I think that's what it happens many times in our lives. At least that's what ha has happened in my life. One interaction alone may not change my life, but a series of interactions with certain people lead me to changes in my life. So that interaction of Zacchaeus and John the Baptist, and then he hears about Jesus and how kind and how loving and how good he is towards everyone. And he longed to see Jesus. And at the same time, he felt that he was a sinner in the sight of God. But because what he had heard of Jesus, that he was nice and kind and loving, he knew that he needed to see him. Also, wasn't Matthew one of his disciples also a tax collector? So I imagine Zacchaeus, I don't know if this happens to you. Sometimes when I, um, I don't know, I'm embarrassed to do something, I reason within my head, you know, all the pros and the cons of whatever I'm trying to do. And I'm guessing Zacchaeus was something like that. Like, okay, I am not a very good person. Oh, but wait, he has a tax collector in his disciples. Oh, but everybody's going to make fun of me. Oh, but I can do this, right? So I, 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 that's, that's how I feel or that's how I can kind of picture Zacchaeus going through all these thoughts. As Zacchaeus' what heart, Zacchaeus's heart was impressed for change and he... And as he began to make reparations, he was often misunderstood. And he was met with mis distrust and suspicion. I would be suspicious if somebody that came to collect my taxes the month before came the following month to say, hey, I got extra cash for you. Sorry be for stealing your money for the past two years, but here's some, some extra money of all the money I have stolen for you. I would 
Because I'm Mexican, I would say like, are these bills fake? You know, is this fake money that you're giving to me or, you know, something else? Oh, how he longed to look at Jesus. He was tired of people not believing his change. The man, Jesus, the man who had brought hope to his heart. And I imagine that in the same way as the woman who suffered from hemorrhages for 12 years, Zacchaeus longed to see Jesus and he knew that only by seeing him, his life could be changed, just like the woman. So he climbed a tree to survey the procession as they pass below the tree. But to his surprise, Jesus stopped right under the tree and told Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Commentaries mention that the unuttered desire of Zacchaeus spoke to the heart of Jesus. And how beautiful is that? Too many times I'm afraid to call for help, to utter the prayer I have wished for over and over again, to start something all over again, like reading my Bible. My dad fell ill in the summer of 2021. Out of nowhere and without any preconditions, he went into kidney failure. In the following six months, he visited many doctors and tried different treatments. To no avail, he started dialysis in early 2022. I clearly remember those first weeks of 2022. I cried very often. I was often crippled with fear and anxiety. I had gone to, to Mexico for, yeah, for, for that Christmas of 2021, and then came, came to, back to Guam in early 2022. And often I would think, like, is this the last time I'm going to see my father? Was that the last time I was going to see my father? I would spend most, of, most part of my day thinking about all the things that could go wrong. I was too afraid to pray. I was too afraid to trust in God's will. Because what if his will was for my dad to rest from all the pain and the endless visits to doctors with no answers? I couldn't even pray for a miracle because I didn't know if I was qualified for one. I mean, what kind of miracle would I pray for? For his kidneys to be completely restored? For a treatment to finally work? I mean, what did I need to do to get a miracle? I felt that my prayers were not effectual, fervent prayers, nor was I a righteous person. I had forgotten all the faults I needed to confess. So would that mean that my dad wasn't going to be healed like James 5 says? What got me through these moments, from, through these months, was my own father's unwavering faith his complete and utter trust in his Redeemer. And just like Zacchaeus, my father had come to understand that just by looking at Jesus, his life would be transformed. And today I can see my dad's life as a miracle. According to the doctors, my dad's kidneys were too small, and that ultimately leads to kidney failure. Most people with small kidneys develop symptoms in their 30s and 40s. And actually, one of my mom's cousins, uh, a couple of months ago, went into kidney failure as well. And he's about 30, 35. My dad, around that same age, around the 30s and 40s, he made a lot of changes to his lifestyle. So his symptoms didn't start showing up until he was 62. And at this point, the doctor said, because of your age, your, your condition will advance very, very slowly. And it's been now two years since he got sick, and he's doing very well with the treatments and medications he's using. And my dad's faith also continues firm in the Lord. And he has grown to the point that he thanks God for his disease. What the devil meant for evil, God meant for good. So with haste, Zacchaeus comes down from the tree and joins Jesus. And as they start walking uh, towards his house, there is a lot of whispering. And the Bible talks about that. There was a lot of like murmur and discontent. 
And so to address the discontent of the people and the rabbis, he turns around, he stops and turns around and confesses and repents publicly. Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have, if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. fourfold. Before Zacchaeus had looked at Jesus, he had responded to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and had begun the work, showed him as, true, as a true penitent. It's something curious, and, and I, went, uh, I went through a quick online search, because both the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus knew the scriptures. And how do I know that? Because all the Jewish boys went through the same education system in their youth, right? So around age five or six, they began what is called Beth Sefer, which is the study and memorization of Torah at age 12, so that from five, or let's say from six years old to age 12, about six years, boys studied the more complicated interpretation of the Torah. And this was most of the time done in a question and answer way. So the first portions for six years, elementary school, it was all memorization. The second part was more, okay, we have this that you know now, that you have memorized, how do you apply it? So it was that question and answer. At age 13, boys would become religious adults. And after this, most gifted students would continue their studies with a local rabbi uh, in what is known as a house of study or Beth Midrash. And this stage involved practicing scenarios, applying the Torah in oral tradition to specific situations. Uh, so again, memorization, then question and answer, then the gifted ones would go into the next stage in which they would be like, this happens, what do we apply to this, right, to specific situations. And then the truly gifted would travel and study with a famous rabbi. And the goal was to become like the rabbi, applying the Torah and oral traditions now, not to scenarios, but to daily situations. At age 20, the students learned the trait, and at age 30, the men would enter in their full ability or capacity or their full um, workforce, if you can say that. So based on this that we know about the rich and ruler in Zacchaeus, it may seem that the ruler was a true or a gifted student, and he was able to spend more time memorizing the Torah and oral traditions. And Zacchaeus may have chosen either the wrong trade at around age 20 or uh, at around like 13 years old, he probably made some wrong decisions and then that led the two men to live completely different lives. So that's just for you to know that both, both of them had memorized the Torah by age 12 and they knew it and they knew how to apply it to specific situations. So once Zacchaeus had experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit, he remembered those words of the Torah that he had been studying about the treatment to our fellow men. In Leviticus 25, 35 to 37, and also verse 17 talks about this. So I'll read those um, verses. Leviticus 25, 35 to 37. And it says the following, yeah. If one of your brethren becomes poor and falls into poverty among you, then you shall help him like a stranger or a sojourner that he may live with you. Take no usury or interest from him, but fear your God that your brother may live with you. You shall not lend him your money for usury, nor lend him your food at a profit. And verse 17 says, therefore, you shall not oppress one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. So all these things that Zacchaeus had learned from very, very young age and memorized came back to him through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And Zacchaeus' response to the love of Christ was manifested through compassion toward the poor and suffering. And you may think, oh, well, this is very natural because, I mean, who wants to hurt or take money or steal from somebody in need. 
However, something you need to know that amongst the tax collectors, there was like a little, in layman's terms, I would say a little gang. And so they would ally themselves, the, all the tax collectors, and they would oppress the people and would we'll find ways to oppress the people and get away with it. So this, has be, this had become an ingrained custom, right, to have the little group of people, a confederacy. So we can see the power of the Holy Spirit in Zacchaeus' life, in the desire to just put all of those things that he had been practicing for probably at least 10, maybe 20 years, and change his life to one of integrity. In the book of Luke, like I've mentioned before, the stories of the rich and ruler and Zacchaeus take place in chapter 18. And I want to read something, three verses from that, before um, I move on. And this one's I did write it there, because I wanted it all to see. Um, so it says, and when Jesus saw yeah, and when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, the rich and ruler, he said, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 26, And those who heard it said, Who then can be saved? But he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And now the disciples had a demonstration of the truth of Christ's words. The things that are impossible with men are possible with God. They witnessed how, through the grace of God, Zacchaeus, who was also a rich man, could enter the kingdom of God. And this morning, I really don't have a recipe to ensure your growth, right? I don't have, I am not a plant person, so even myself, I need some kind of, every time I get a plant, I'm like, tell me every detail I need to know about how not to kill this plant. Because most of the time, I do. Even um, how the succulents that they say that the hardest to kill, well, a couple of succulents that John and I brought to, back to Saipan, an ant ate it, and then I think it was too hot, so it kind of melted, so plants is not my thing. But I don't have a, a recipe to ensure your growth, the growth in Christ. I cannot tell you, if you read your Bible every day and memorize entire books, you will for sure experience growth in Christ because both Zacchaeus and the, rulers, the ruler knew the scriptures. One said, I have kept everything from my youth. In the other, the other um, in Zacchaeus, who had an appearance of a hardened man, with a job that was, that every time you, you heard he's a tax collector or what you heard he's a publican, you would um, equate that to injustice and extortion. However, his heart was susceptible to divine influences. So probably the rich and ruler re read his Bible more often, but, you know, so I cannot tell you, okay, that is the one recipe for your growth. I cannot tell you, if you come to church every Sabbath, every prayer meeting, and every Vespers, you will for sure experience growth. Because the ruler had probably attended all the meetings in the synagogue and all the yearly feasts, all of them. I, 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 I do not know how many there are. I didn't look it up. And Zacchaeus was no longer accepted in the synagogues. But when Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, Zacchaeus house became the most favored house in all of Jericho. And people were gathering around Jesus and hearing for themselves the words of life. I cannot tell you, if you accept every job in the church in order for, you, you must accept every job in the church in order to fulfill the mission of the church. Why I cannot tell you that? Because the ruler who was in a position of leadership and trust, when called to action, and participate as a collaborator, collaborator with Jesus in the work of salvation, he held on to his temporal riches in the rejection of heavenly treasures. In Zacchaeus, who was a man who had oppressed his own countrymen for many, many years, along with other publicans, at the call of the Holy Spirit, he immediately began to the work on making restitutions to those who he had wrong, who, whom he had wrong. What I can tell you is that Jesus 
by his death in the cross, triumphed over the forces of evil. So we are no longer subjugated by the burdens of anything we have done in the past. Jesus' victory gives us victory over those evil forces that seek to control, control us. We no longer walk in darkness, fear of evil, fear of evil powers and ignorance. We now walk in Jesus in peace, joy, and assurance of his love. And as we do so, our lives begin to be transformed. And just as we cannot see the moment-by-moment moment growth of plants, and I was thinking of kids as well. I don't have kids of my own yet, but you know, sometimes I see kids and then I don't see them for a month and I see them again and they are super tall. And I'm like, what happened to you? And I, for, for, you, for those of you that are parents, I don't think you were able to track your kids' growth from day to day, probably like month to month or week to week. But just the same way that we don't see the moment-by-moment moment growth in plants, little by little, everyone around us starts seeing our spiritual growth. Because we share more of what we learn from Scripture, we are less afraid of sharing God's words with others, we contemplate on a daily basis the God's presence in our lives, we come to church with joy, singing as loud as we can, and we accept the church job we have been rejecting for so many years. And this is like a positive feedback loop. As we give ourselves in loving service to those around us and in witnessing to his salvation, his constant presence, God's constant presence with us through the Spirit transforms every moment and every task in our lives, and we keep growing in Christ. So this morning, I don't have a challenge for you or a call, but an invitation to contemplate and create a plan of action that will help you to witness tremendous growth and change in your life. So something I would like to start doing again, for example, I, I, I said if I am going to call, I'm going to invite you to for a plan of action. Uh, back in 2021, I used to write my prayer requests, and I did this for two reasons, because I would forget. Um, and number two, I wanted to, it, when my prayers were answered, I wanted to write like the date and how they were answered. And I did this, um, yeah, so as I was doing this, I did it for several months um, during, during 2021. I was able to witness God's undeniable presence in my life. And I would go back and, and said, and, and say, wow, God did answer that prayer. For example, my, my brother had lost his wallet on that, that summer. Somebody stole his wallet. He didn't lose it. Somebody stole his wallet. And I don't know where he, where he lost it or where, where it was stolen, but it was almost impossible for him to get it back. And so I did, I did a little prayer about that. We prayed for several weeks. And then, or for several, sorry, not weeks, for several days. And then... Out of nowhere, his wallet came back. It didn't have any more money, but that was okay. But he didn't have to process many IDs that he would have to process if, he, if the wallet hadn't come back. And so if I hadn't prayed for that, I would not have seen, or if I hadn't written it and remembered to pray over and over again for it, I would not have seen the answer, right? So that, I have that as a, as a memory there, and it's written, and I cannot forget it. And so now I cannot say, oh, God doesn't answer prayers, right? Because God answered, pray answered, answered that, that prayer. So as I was doing that, I was able to see God's, God's presence in my life, and little by little, my faith grew that summer. And that was actually the summer right before I went to visit my dad when he got really sick. So that's my invitation today. What action or challenge will you take to see the evidence of God's presence in your life? And I want to leave you with a verse from 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we compare the stories of Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler, 
whose life were very different in their adult lives, were probably very similar in their youth. But when it came to a moment to, to, to answer the call, to answer the call to action to, to look out at, at the needs of others, one of them rejected it and the other one followed through. Please, Father, give us courage to make a plan to be more intentional about our relationship with you. And in, the, and in being more intentional, that we are able to witness the changes that you can make in our life, in our lives, and that others see as well, and witness the power that you have to help us grow in you. Please be with us as we take on different paths today and help us to keep your presence in our lives always. In Jesus' name, amen.